So this is what we have in common, actually, in Zoroastrianism with Abraham and We do ascribe the priest to be closest to God, to talk to God on our behalf, etc. Yeah. Judas but your God for me is very God. ethereal and idea-based, whereas my God is actually incarnate. Yes, it's true. It's a difference in Christianity and Zoroastrianism. Welcome to Manifesto. My name is Paul Robson, and this is a conversation with author, philosopher, and all-round entertainer, Alexander Bard. So Manifesto was started back in 2016 as a partnership between myself and Alexander Bard. And after several years, we came to a state where we realized that there were unreconcilable differences between the two of us in our vision and our values, and working together was going to be impossible. And so we decided to part ways in 2022. It's no secret that a large part of these differences stem from my conversion to Orthodox Christianity. And especially when I saw so many men that were struggling with their sexuality and not knowing how to deal with it and trying to find a pragmatic framework to help men to move forward, then that's when the sparks really started to fly. Uh, and so we've only really had one conversation since that happened which was in Berlin. We were both on a panel debate at a conference about marriage. Um, and this is now our second conversation coming up here. Recently, there's been a couple of clashes, I understand, between Alexander and some other Christians. And I think that these clashes are going to be inevitable uh, if one, as a Christian, tries to work closely together with Alexander, given that the worldviews are just so far apart from each other. But I also see that Alexander, despite what one could call his hard-headedness, uh, also has a philosopher's uh, dedication to seeking truth. And I really appreciated the effort that he put in to listen to me in a respectful way. Uh, and I felt like he was really taking things in as well. So for that, I'm really grateful. So one more thing before we go into the interview. I just want to mention that I am but a simple lay person in the Orthodox faith. I'm not clergy and I don't represent the Orthodox Church in any way. So while we don't do talk quite a bit about religion, then I want to make it clear that I might have made mistakes. I'm fairly new as an Orthodox Christian and I would, of course, defer to clergy and to official church positions if there's any differences in the opinions expressed here. So without further ado, here comes Alexander. Alexander Bard, uh, we talk Paul again. Paul <laughs> <laughs> There, yeah. and here's here's a glass of South African white wine. It's it's a Sauvignon Blanc. It's not my favorite, which is always a Chenin Blanc. But uh, I miss South Africa so much at the moment, and I loved going there together with you, exploring our childhood and upbringing in South Africa together. Yeah, Cheers. we've done that once. I'm not sure it's going to happen anytime soon. I'm I'm on just a cam cameline tea in a milk jug. <laughs> so you're doing the big city thing. I'm doing the countryside thing, I guess, today. Well, you've got two kids in Denmark these days, two small kids. So your South African family relatives obviously going to Denmark now to visit you because the kids are there, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. So yeah, we moved, right. my wife and I moved three years ago or three and a half years ago now out to the Danish countryside on a little homestead two and a half hectares of land. We have a lot of sheep. They keep on having more, more sheep. So we have- And still goats? And... No, goats, goats no goats, no goats, no goats. No, but we're, okay. we're, we're making sheepskins this year and we eat a lot of lamb. Um, and uh, we were just talking before we recorded. I, I, I decided I want to keep the story for uh, the uh, for the recording here. Uh, so you gave me a, a carved wooden statue of your <laughs> own uh, bust, uh, Alexander Bard statue um, some time ago. And uh, and we use it very regularly, actually, because uh, the the there's a group of guys here who really play a lot of uh, airsoft hardball, where we run around these very realistic looking weapons and shoot each other. Uh, and and so the 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 bust, the head, beca has become our like I'm escort VIP that we have to like carry around while the other two. Have to come <laughs> shoot the, shoot well, that if team. there ever was a statue of Alexander Bart, it should be used ironically, and I'm glad it is. So there you go. Yeah. 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 So uh, no, it's it's definitely it's a beautiful statue, and um, and we are using it a lot, and yeah, um, thing, things are going well. So it's been quite a time. We spoke last time in Berlin, uh, on yes. a, on a panel on marriage, and I was actually very surprised at how much we agreed. Uh, I, for me, the main conclusion that came out of that was that for the large majority of men, um, marriage is uh, an extremely you know something to be considered very carefully and not done in haste at all but also a very very good path to bring stability uh and strength into a man's life to help him to mature and grow into manhood actually as well i think nine men out of ten should get married 
and have a wife and raise a family. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is mistaken here in our culture today is this myth that got started in the 19th century that romantic love was everything. And I think romantic love came to fill the emptiness of Christianity. Mm -hmm. when Christianity was gone from our culture and he took that role. And my God, romantic love cannot replace a religion like Christianity. Far from it. I mean, it's ridiculous. Romantic love is there to last for a few months to get the attention of another of a woman or or a man. Um, just just because there's something interesting there, they should explore. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, too, what I call marriage today, when the guys come to me for counseling, is that I call it self arranged marriage. It's the only way to make it work. And you did that with Laura admirably, and I love you guys for it. And I think that's why it works. What it means is that you should really look to to marriage as starting a company with somebody who's devoted like you. For the rest of their lives to be committed to this idea and that what it, what, it, what it means to raise children together. I think the divorce rates in our society today are horrible. Mm -hmm. I think kids are growing up with, you know, in, in a decadent environment where they're totally lost. They, they, they go like between narcissism on one end, like you should figure out everything for yourself. And on the other hand, parents are just gone out of the window and, and they're totally lonely in that experience. And I don't think that's the way kids should be brought up. So um, I'm a great defender of what I call self French marriage. And, and at the end of the day, no matter what spiritual path we choose or no matter what archetype we are, I'm personally a monk. I should not raise a family. I take care of men when they're older instead. And I, I, my ambition is to build monasteries. And I work with women who do the same thing for girls and women. That's my commitment. But I support all the men who come through the door and said that I want to find the right woman. I want to get married. And I want to raise children. I said, find the right woman, not just any woman. And going to that sort of almost corporate mentality about the whole thing, like raising kids together is like the most spectacular thing you could do. But my point is that a civilization is never more civilized than it's women's willingness to give birth to children. Mm -hmm. And in today's society, when women say, no, I'm opting out. I don't want our children any longer then that's a really dangerous path we're going. Mm -hmm. It will work. Mm -hmm. That I think it, that I think is what we're going. So we were it's one of the symptoms of the together. crisis and that we're facing at the moment. I think for Senia and I, uh, one of the really important things that I'm really happy that I did today actually is I asked our priest before I decided to propose to her what he thought about it. I brought my own parents to Denmark and we hung out with Laura for a month uh traveling around with her uh, so they really could get to know her well and then i asked my parents what do you think about this woman is this woman who can who can really help me because my parents i actually came to realize probably know me a lot better than 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 i appreciate always and and i think they've you know i've fought against their advice for most of my life and then i realized like no there's actually um really obviously i don't just take everything that they say to me uh, first, uh, straight off the bat, but I, I really found that very useful. And then I actually went up to Laura's father and I asked him to come out on a walk with me. And I, and I asked him, I said to him, uh, would you let me, would you give me your daughter's hand in marriage? And he was like, Paul, we don't do that kind of thing in Denmark anymore. Like, that's like weird. weird. And, and, and that's what he said back then. But I think actually today we go on walks regularly, long walks in the countryside and talk uh, about our, his grandchild, my son, uh, or my sons and his grandchildren and, and, and our family and, and how we're growing together. We live very close to him now as well. And so I, I'm really happy that I did that because it created a foundation of respect and appreciation, which is really, really valuable. So and I think that's something that you this, and me also is agree family. is the extended this is family. Family. But family is much, what I meant, sometimes I've been misunderstood, but as a nuclear family doesn't hold. I mean, nuclear is just the fundamental, just man, woman, sexual relationship. And, 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 and of course, the nuclear family came out as an idea, out of the idea that romantic love would fix everything. And it doesn't. The journey starts with getting married. It starts. It's it's a fantastic journey. And I came from a large family. Parents held together until my father died. Mother's now a 90 years old, terrific woman. Yeah, they had their ups and downs, but my God, they raised five kids, you know, a large family, tons of love, huge dinners, loads of relatives. I have, I don't know how many cousins I've got, but I've got cousins all around the world. And this large sense of family, now when I'm an older man, and I'm the only one out of five siblings who decided not to have children myself, I appreciate it so much. And I just try to be a good uncle to my nieces and family is everything. It really is. But How is your is mother doing, thing. Alexander? 90 years old. Uh, when did you last see her? Oh, I went to see her only a week ago. I miss her so much when I'm not with her. We have a terrific time together. She's super sharp. She's 90. She doesn't have the same eyesight. You know, she needs hearing aids, but her brain is super sharp. Her mind, her mind is there all the time. And we can talk about everything.
She's yeah. a great mother. She's okay. A great mother. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we have a couple of subjects and I'm sure we could go in like many different directions, but one of the central things that we agreed on, we'd have a chat about today is Orthodox Christianity. Uh, both yes. of us have noticed that there are just young men flocking to Orthodox Christianity at the moment. Uh, part of it is about that the current materialist worldview seems to be falling apart. We agree that spirituality is a necessary element. We need to rediscover our souls as human beings in our society yeah. in the West if we're going to get through this. Um, and even here on this little way far out in the countryside, little uh, island where I'm living, then I went into the Romanian Orthodox Church the other day, and there's this like young 16 year old guy, boxer, super strong, really focused on everything he wants to do in life. And I said, like, how on earth did you step into an Orthodox Church? And he was just, well, he went onto social media and he was watching some videos and he figured out that Orthodox Christianity is the one true faith. <laughs> and so now he wants to become baptized. Uh, and, and this is something that's happening all over the entire world. Um, and it's something quite yeah, it's quite a movement. It's quite a movement. And by the way, I love the Romanian Orthodox uh, Christian guys because they got the best liquor. So <laughs> having best stayed in monasteries, yeah. having stayed in many monasteries, I think the Romanian Orthodox monasteries are the most fun. But I, I've done that journey too. My, my, I should just say that my choice was to start looking somewhere else when I wanted to get out of this sort of secular atheist kind of society. And I found a home in Eastern spirituality and pursued that. I'm a Zoroastrian myself. But I admired you guys who just stand where you're at realize you live in Europe, for example, and, and start from there. And then, of course, Christianity is first option, which should always be researched. You should always know what Christianity is all about. You should always know Christianity is central role in Western culture. And, and apparently, in your case, at least, Protestantism and Catholicism weren't good enough or they weren't the right thing. Why, why did you pick Orthodoxy? Why is Orthodoxy the one of the three main Christian branches that young men are picking today? What do you think that is? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this. I can give a hundred different answers to that question, but the the most central one I can say is like, if you go to the roots of things, you get to orthodoxy. I, and I think it's people are tired of standing on things that break after a certain amount of time. When you really follow them to their logical conclusions, then they just don't work anymore. And so that, and that's what we're seeing with everything that we've had our trust in. So I think orthodoxy is is the result of of looking further and further back and looking for something that's been unchanged. Uh, it really flips a lot of things on its head and sees things in, a, in, an, in an opposite way uh, than what we're used to in the West. So it's a very, very different mindset. Uh, it's quite far in many ways. It's been a thousand years since Denmark was Orthodox, um, but it is the original Christianity that Christianized the Vikings, for example, uh, which is, you know, the, the, the local place here. It, it is that religion that, you know, when, when it met with these pagan religions, there was no contest. Uh, it, it took some time, of course, but, you know, even after 300 years, it took over the Roman Empire. Um, and and all other religions, you know, faded away. And then with time, you know, I, I heard the argument used recently that there's like 44,000 Christian denominations. And so therefore we can't take any of them seriously. But I actually think that looking at that argument and thinking about it a bit more, uh, there's, there's actually an error in that reasoning. I, I think more what it is is, you know, the existence of 44,000 variants of Christianity shows that there's something very powerful at the core of it. I agree totally. And a lot of people oh, okay. have been using why, that for their own why advantage. You, yeah, why would you and, want and to so religious, they've created all kinds of different modifications of yeah. it that no, aren't no. working very well. Yes. Uh, and that's what's become to, to, to be able to represent Christianity for a lot of people. But actually, if you go down to the core, what you find is orthodoxy. Uh, and this is something that hasn't changed. You know, the Catholic Church had the Pope and the Pope has made many, many changes to the faith. Protestantism is obviously based on protest and change and being against all the things that came before. Uh, and, you know, obviously, Popes, uh, sorry, uh, Catholics and Protestants are going to find objections to that. But but if you look at the Orthodox faith, that is the one version of Christianity that that is still built on what exactly what the church fathers said. Uh, we can't change the things that were established by the first Christian councils. And so there's would you, a solidity would you agree with, yeah, would you agree with me then that when I go to Orthodox Mass, it's much closer to Judaism than the other forms of Christianity are? Absolutely, yeah. It's, yeah, it's it, uh, what, I, what I said. And, and here's the thing. Judaism, though, is closed in the sense you can convert to Judaism, but it's actually people, which is also religion. So you have to you have to convert in a very complicated way to get into Judaism. And therefore, orthodoxy is an easier option. In that case, you're looking for sort of some kind of original spirituality here from men, I guess so. Yes, that yeah. makes sense. Do you have to get circumcised to become a Jew still these days? I assume you do. <laughs> I'm not uh, yes, sure. Yes, you do. Actually. No. Yeah, yeah. For, in Israel, for example, so. you cannot be accepted as a Jewish convert in Israel unless you actually go through orthodox, Christian, orthodox Judaism. Mm. Only the orthodox Jews can actually convert. That's mm -hmm. kind of a, you know, 
it's not a law in Israel, but it's the way it works. And if you're going to get an Israeli passport as a Jew, then mm -hmm. you have to go through that process. So you yeah. actually have to become an Orthodox Jew and get circumcised and all that to, to, to become a Jew in Israel. Otherwise, yeah. you're not, at least according to Israeli law, you're not accepted as a Jew. Yeah. So, so when you read the Old so Testament as an Orthodox Christian, so Rastinism we... is different. So Rastinism, we do not have a large following and we don't have to be the spiritual solution to anything. We don't. We, so Rastinism does not pretend that it's the universal religion. So Rastinism is a choice. It's like a philosophical school or a school of spirituality you subscribe to. And therefore, conversion itself is not difficult. But since we're not trying to reach the masses and so Rastinism, we have a few million followers. It, it's one spiritual school among many, which is why I love to get engaged with you in this conversation, for example. Uh, so Rastinism is different. So, so this is different to Zoroastrianism and Jew. But Zoroastrianism is more like the origin of Islam. And when I talk to Muslims today, I am myself a practicing Sufi because Sufism is much older than Islam. So I'm what we call it Sufi with a Z, Z rather than an S because it explains it's Zoroastrian Sufism because it's the original Sufism. And I'm a practicing Sufi myself. I'm a Kalandari of Sufis is called, but I'm not a Muslim. And I do not want to be associated with Islam because I think it's gone completely wrong, you know. But I go back then to Zoroastrianism. The same way some Western guys go all the way to convert to Judaism rather than Christianity because they're looking for the deepest possible spiritual path that mm. constitutes Western culture. But yeah. it makes sense that orthodoxy is, is an easier option, at least to begin with. It's the original form of Christianity. True, it has a universal aspect to it. And it has this lineage all the way back to the original church that the other uh, dom denominations actually are lacking. Yeah. I want to ask you a question about Zoroastrianism, actually. Uh, I just want to, the one little thing I want to mention first is, so as Orthodox Christians, when we read the Old Testament, then we see everything as pointing towards Christ. Uh, and so he is the fulfillment of everything there. It, it, it is the, we see it as like the, the Orthodox Church is the natural inheritor of that tradition, actually. And the Jewish people have, crucified Christ, rejected him, uh, and and gone on a very different path, actually. Uh, and a lot of Judaism was actually reestablished and adjusted as a reaction to Christianity. Uh, and, and so you can see that the, the, the you know, the, the Judaism practice today is actually different from, from what you saw in the time of Christ as well. So the question I wanted to ask you, uh, though, uh, Alexander, is I, I think some of, a lot of the issues that you'll see in, you know, meetings with uh, you know, in the men's movement about Christianity is the the opinions about uh, miracles, resurrection, heaven, hell, afterlife, eternity, and stuff like that as well. So all of the research that I've been able to do about Zoroastrianism points to the existence of uh, an eternal uh, afterlife of, I think it's the house of song and the house of lies. No, uh, no, and that, that's, which that, are that, Which are the, very yeah. much equivalents of, of heaven and hell. So probably, no, no. The thing with Zoroastrianism is that the original text of Zoroastrianism is the Gothos by Zoroastrian himself. And right now, if you look at the community, the online community, it's also attracting a lot of young men today. Mm -hmm. um, it's whether it's the Pablo Vasquez or the Al Jaffrey translation to English because most guys can't read ancient Persian. There's not a word anywhere about heaven or hell or an afterlife anywhere in Zoroastrianism. Rather, I would say with Zoroastrianism, if you look at the behaviors, uh, the Persians were the opposite of the Egyptians because the Egyptians spent fortunes building pyramids and basically were so focused on the afterlife they forgot about the life here and now, which even Christianity is against. Uh, so Gnosticism, in the sense that everything beneath your your throat here is evil. I don't think Christianity is against that, but no, 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 exactly. Christianity, Christianity is against the complete focus on the afterlife to ignore the life here and now. I mean, this Augustine, for example, Not the life of a monk. Dealt with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but. In Zoroastrianism, it's a life here and now and nothing else, which is why the Persians trained themselves to not build graveyards for their dead, but rather you take the corpse, you put it out in nature, you let the vultures eat it, essentially, to teach yourself that when somebody dies, that person has died. What is reincarnated, Zoroastrianism has the same origin as Hinduism, what is reincarnated is the archetype. The, po the thing is that whatever role you had within the community, within the Anjuman, is being replaced by somebody else. So it's reincarnated as the archetype. It's the father, it's the mother, the son, the daughter, you know, all the different archetypes that build the community together in Anjuman, which is what Zoroastrianism shares with Christianity and Judaism, this strong, strong focus on the community. Uh, the Anjuman in Zoroastrianism later becomes the congregation in Christianity. It's the same idea. So, and that's what these religions are good for people. But in the archetypes being, res being reincarnated, there is no resurrection of any specific person. So there is no afterlife. Now, later, 
folk religion invents all kinds of ideas, afterlife and things like that. And the problem here with, with Zoroastrians, I would say, is that once you have moved from process only like Hinduism, which is nothing but reincarnation, and you moved from that to the event that something can happen that changes history forever, which Zoroastrians invented, and which is a strong idea in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. They're actually built on events, eventology, for example, Christ on the cross is a total break with history. There's a for and an after that, that specific event. So Christianity is an eventology. So the problem with Zoroastrianism is that it intrusives the event, and the problem with Zoroastrianism is that it's an event and a process at the same time. I find that philosophically incredibly interesting, but it's very, very difficult to build the large religion on. It's mm -hmm. like a philosophical stance you're taking if you join Zoroastrianism, like, here's a contradiction within the religion itself, because we can't really make up mind whether the process or the event mm -hmm. are the, the either or the other. And it becomes a yin and yang situation. Taoism is essentially the same idea, but in China, it becomes that you put the process into one aspect as a principle, you call it yin, and you put it then on woman, in the female realm, and then you took the other principle, the event, and you put it on yang, and you put it on the male realm. So... That's how you basically look at the world. You start looking at the world as process event. By the way, the name of my latest book, which is a, basically Zoroastrian manifesto. But this, this is how we deal with it in Zoroastrianism. So what we saw then after Zoroastrianism was the Judaism took off in an eventological direction because the exodus, leaving Egypt for the promised land becomes the biggest event ever. At least it is for the Jewish people. Christ on the cross became the biggest event ever for Christianity. And it certainly is. It's a mass, massive event in history for anybody. And then you got Muhammad storming Mecca, or whatever it was, becomes the major event in Islam. So these religions become what we call eventological religions. That's different from Eastern spirituality. Mm -hmm. The East knows nothing about events that change history forever. It only knows storytelling that basically tell everybody that everything is reincarnated. It goes mm -hmm. back to the same place all the time. Okay. Traditions. And that's India and China for you. Yeah. I mean, so Alexander, you obviously know more about Zoroastrian than I do, but I, I have a quote here from the Gathas itself, which I can read it up to if you want me to. Sure, sure, sure. But yeah, it states, let's go ahead. It states, yeah, so let's read it. Kavians and Karapans, the devil-worshipping priests and princes, are united and try and destroy the spiritual or true lives of the people by their evil deeds. And when they approach the judgment bridge, they are yeah. ashamed of their souls and inner selves, which shall chide them as they fall down into the abode of untruth, where they are obligated to dwell forever. And this yes. is talking about many, the afterlife. Yeah, many this mistakes here. This is, this is not a very good translation. I'll tell you what. Shinavat is not a judgment bridge at all. Shinavat is just to go into a tantric state, which not everybody should visit. But you will do it at least once in your life, and that's called death. So it's, it's, it's literally a way for you to measure the values of your actions. So you, it's not a judgment. You make the judgment. It's not a judgment bridge that judges you. You make the judgment about your own life by positioning yourself in relation to the Shinavat. And if you're on the priesthood side of things, if you're a Mobed, which means you're a priest within the community, or if you're a Zaltar, which means you're a priest outside of the community in the wilderness, you recognize how similar this is to Christianity. The two different types of priests here. And these two priests must always, like the matriarch of the community, they must always submit to their own process Shinavat on a regular basis to be a proper leader. So Shinavat is here as a metaphor for the judgment where you judge yourself to something. So literally the bridge here is not to the effort. The bridge is literally crossing outside of the community into the wilderness. This is what Christ does when Christ goes out into the wilderness to try himself against the devil and be tempted before he goes in back into the community to do his deeds. I mean, all, all the interpretations of Zoroastrians I've been able to find, this is the, these verses are understood as relating to the afterlife. No, uh, no, 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 to, no, 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 life. no, so no, no. It seems no, to me I'm, from a minority I'm, view I'm of a Zoroastrianism. Listen, I'm a member, listen, I am a Zoroastrian. So I'm a member yeah. of a community of 13,000 people, not a single one of them believes any of that. But this okay. is the Western reinterpretation mm -hmm. of Persian culture, which is seen through that, okay. specifically through Islam. No, I, is I believe you that if it's a Western reinterpretation. And also, and also, you have the word evil deeds in there. The word evil does not exist in the Persian language. What exists is spent on man you, constructive mentality, and angra man you, destructive mentality. This is the same thing as you do if you're a Brahmin in India. You get up in the morning to meditate. I do it every morning. I do my Diana. It's called Diana, and it's called Diana in Persian. I do my Diana in the morning. I basically look through my life and look into the different feedback loops I'm involved with. So I do this, I do this movement, feedback loops. It, it, what constructive thinking can I possibly have and get the destructive thinking out of the way? It's like you remove drush, destructive thinking, destructive loops which, which, that shrink you, that shrink people around you. And you have loops, constructive loops that expand you 
and makes you expand other people around you. So constructive deeds, spent them on your other nangra money. These are the words directly from Sorast himself. Yeah, then yeah, you I, can I, look, I, then I you can look at your commitment. Then you look, look at your commitment. It's like you... Zoroastrian is seen as a dualistic religion of good and evil. No, 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 uh, no, no, and, no, and this no, is, no, so no, I, no. I get it, because this is a Western it, reinterpretation. I know, I know, but it's dead wrong. It's dead wrong. And this is the thing. Father Sir from Rose. Yeah. But there's no good and evil. No, there's no good. It's constructive and destructive. No, I, I, I believe proper, you that, that you have a different interpretation. Are you familiar with I'm... Father Sarah from Rose? No, who's that? No, okay. So Father Sarah from Rose was a, lived in, he grew up in the 50s in California. Uh, he yeah. attended Ponema University and Berkeley. Uh, he was a student of Alan Watts, actually. Um, yeah. And then, and was very, yeah, also a very much a Nietzschean, uh, followed of Frederick Nietzsche. Um, and very, drawn into this idea of kind of like a meta understanding of all religion, very similar to, I think, what, what you have as well. Uh, yeah. And went deeper and deeper into this and examined it more and actually came out of the other side. He went into René Guénon, who you might also be familiar with. Oh, René Guénon for me as a Sufi is incredibly important. Yeah, yeah. So I imagine he's also, yeah, he, yeah. René yeah. Guénon, French sure thinker, late 19th well. century, amazing thinker, <clears throat> Sufi, but, yes. But then um, Father Seraphim Rose then, as you can tell from the name, ended up converting to Orthodox Christianity and mm. becoming an Orthodox monk. And he wrote a book, uh, he's written several books, but one of his most well-known books is called Orthodoxy and the Religion of the Future. Uh, and what he defines as the religion of the future is basically this um, coming together of all different ph philosophies and religions under one hat and an idea of a kind of a superior religion. And he, opposed, he said orthodoxy was opposed to that. And I think this is part of the reason why we're having a lot of conflict between the Christian guys and the rest of the men's movement actually as well. Um, basically what he said is that what it does is it builds on the idea that there's no absolute truths, uh, basically from Nietzsche. Uh, and thus spoke Zarathustra. Well, that's a misinterpretation of Nietzsche, but move on. Yeah, go on, go on, go on. Yes, um, yes, yes. That's not what Nietzsche means. I think it's a direct yeah. quote from, from Nietzsche. Well, Nietzsche says yeah. that the, all the highest things are losing their value. Uh, and they're all becoming kind of like equal and, and 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 lower down, and that's why we have to transcend it and become the Superman. And 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 so, I, 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 Rose, I, would, I, would, I would just I would I would definitely translate Nietzsche differently, and I do so in my books. But yeah, we can go back to that later. But go okay. back to Rose. This is interesting. Yeah. Yes. So what he sees is is that this attempt to try and, um, yeah, build a kind of. Uh, an ecumenical system of everybody is the same and we all worship the same God, um, but it's a watering down of the actual fundamental Christian beliefs, which includes oh, I think stuff so like... Too. I think you and I agree on one thing we can agree on right here. We love decentralization. Uh, we think human society is much better if it's decentralized. I like variety. I like many different opinions. I love lovely debates. I'm tough with Christians. You know that in philosophical, theological debates. And I love for them to be tough with me, which is why I do correct you when I think we're actually building our arguments on misinterpretations, which we should try to avoid so we can get to the real beliefs here. Uh, I'm totally open to that. I'm totally open to changing my mind, but I believe there's an absolute truth. And so did Nietzsche. It was the accessibility of the absolute truth that even if Germano Kant philosophers understood was very, very hard. What I'm saying is that human beings retell their experience of life through different myths. Mm -hmm. And these myths can get to the core of what it means to be human. We can find a truth of what it means to be human, which is an existential truth. And religion does deal with that. Mm -hmm. Science can deal with whatever absolute truths it wants out there. It can measure anything it likes. Religion really deals with the spiritual path and with their own truth towards herself. Or the way I say it is factual truth is something you probably can skip and leave over to science or become a scientist to enjoy. It. But the truth we talk about here is the truth we mean when we say, I am true to myself. I am true to my calling. I am true, for example, I am true to my archetype. I'm going to be a father and raise a family and kids. But that's not the truth or, I would talk about. Or, or the truth the truth that is that I'm the truth. Well, this is the spiritual truth to me, which is the most important truth. Mm -hmm. And it's also absolute once you see yourself clearly and you go on your mission and you pursue who you should be, that's an absolute truth, certainly. And Nietzsche was, was what he was totally for that. But when you say it's, totally it's about I'm a truth to myself, is it just an individual truth then? Or when you say universal, does that mean it's 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 relevant? No, 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 it's not. You know, I'm not an individualist at all. 
like you. I'm a great proponent of big family, tribal communities. And I just want to make people try to extend their imagination beyond just the tribal towards larger entities like a whole religion, a nation, a city. If we can, I think religion's most important mission for the past 10,000 years has been to try to extend people's imagination to something larger than just the tribal, which comes naturally to them. Because we have to live in larger communities, we have to live in peace. And to prolong peace for as long as possible, as all major religions do have in common, at least when they're on the best side, you know. And, and, and this is this this is what I think we can agree on too. That this is interesting. And I love decentralization. I dislike the fact that Catholicism is completely dependent on the Pope in Rome. I, I think it's ridiculous. I, I love the fact that Orthodoxy has many different versions. And you could talk about even Russians and Ukrainian churches being and fighting with each other at the moment. Well, still, that's not a center which I like because this decentralization is a healthy thing. And in Zoroastrianism, we do not have a center anywhere. We do not have one dogma. We don't look for it. Yeah. Yeah, we, I mean, we talk about it. conciliarity and that and that thing, and it and it's all it's both kind of both and we really believe in hierarchy. Certainly, the whole yes. of life is hierarchical. Even all of our saints are hierarchical. Uh, we, you know, Mary is actually the highest of all the Christian saints. Uh, John the Baptist, he's he's the icon right over there. Uh, he's he's next to him, uh, next to her uh, on on the iconostasis of every single. I would person. say that's because um, mother and prophet are two super archetypes in any community. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. It's the mother and the prophet. Those two yeah. archetypes are the, right there. You just described it. So that's but, uh, how, if, how if we have to dwell on, on the idea of truth just a little bit longer, um, are there truths which are universally applicable at all times for all human beings? I think there are three different types of truths and they should not be reduced to one another. There is the logos, which is factual reality as it is. There's the pathos, okay, which is a, a, that's a different a, a different use I know, of the logos. But that's that actually what use. the word means in Greek <laughs> originally. It's a Greek word. So I'm, I'm just using. The, I know the Christians use it differently, but it's a Greek word. Yeah. And this is this is Heraclitus' uh, description mm -hmm. of logos, which is older than Christianity. But mm -hmm. so I use logos yeah, in that sense. Please just compare it with the other two, and then, oh, yeah, yeah. then you understand. The I'm other one is pathos, so that's what you feel. So you, you, what you feel, your feelings, you know, uh, newscasts and things like that are, are trying to be logical, they trying to be practical narratives, like it's happening right now and it's real, right? And, and it's pathos. The third one is the mythos, and mythos is often the only way to combine the other two. Like men say, mm -hmm. we have two brain halves. One is the logos, one is the pathos. They never meet. And I said, well, you actually have to construct the story about yourself in the world as being in the world in a relationship to your society, in relationship to your community. Mm -hmm. That story you're creating is always a mythos. Therefore, it's a temporary truth, but it has to change all the time because conditions around you change. Now, because mythos has to be redefined all the time doesn't mean that truth is relative. No, mythos is where it's at at the moment, and you must follow your mythos in the sense that this is the best story you can have about the unity of the logos and the pathos. But when the logos can operate separately, like it tries to do in science, or the pathos operates separate logos, which it does when you feel your feelings and you directly have access to your experience, your feelings, and you're fine with that and you join. Well, if you do that, you're in the pathos. So that at least three different ways that human beings approach truth. We call this narratology in our philosophy. So a narratology means that accept the three truths. Don't try to reduce them to one another. Rather look at it like it's even it's even on the sexual side of things because man is the fight between the logos and the pathos. The woman is very much the mythos because women come with unity. Women mm -hmm. stand for unity in the way, that, whereas men yeah. stand for struggle in the way that women don't. I, I think it, it sounds you, like a good, a good and useful heuristic that I don't really have any serious objections to. No. Uh, the one thing that I would have an objection to, though, is when you say that the mythos changes all the time. Because obviously we've seen that the way that Christ is reinterpreted and changed, it just really degrades and pulls things away. So what we believe is that the people who are closest to Christ, who actually yeah. met him and spoke with him, they were the ones who knew him best. They actually had the direct transmission of that mythos. And yeah, so that the, is why you the, call it logos. You, that as, you believe that as you believe that truth. Yeah. You, that is why the, this is precisely why it's called logos in the Bible. That's why Orthodox Christians believe that is the logos. It's yeah. an undisputable fact. Yeah, and that, that, and that was a way was of real. integrating yes. Eastern thought. But for me, I would actually in your in your kind of little your 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 the way you use those those terms, I would actually say you said like mythos is the one that can unite the other two, and I'd say you know for me, Christ is truth. Truth, God is truth. Christ is truth. Uh, and and so he's synonymous with that. God, truth is a person, not just an abstract concept. Uh, yeah, but a person that's is what can unite uh, paradoxes in, into one thing, right? That that's what yeah. human beings but do. But this is both a rational and an emotional explanation, isn't it? Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, it's both when natural. you come, my argument is when you combine the two, it's a mythos. You can call it, what's wrong with mythos? You call it a super mythos, you know, whatever no, yeah, you it, want to call it. it. But the so unity of the logos and the pathos sense, has yeah. that word in Greek, in the Greek language called mythos. And yeah. the great thing about seeing three different truths is that absolute truth is absolutely there. The ultimate absolute truth, this was what Hegel said about the narratology. The absolute in Hegel is that the three are all there. And they're irreducible to one another, and they're all fantastic, and they're on a par with each other, depending on use. Yeah. You use them for different things, right? If you're going to build the house, you certainly use the logos. You want to know exactly what you're building the house with so you can stand forever. In the Bible, it says you want to build your house on a rock and not on sand. That's logos for you. That's exactly what logos is so determined. But there's also blood, and there's emotions, and there are feelings, there's electricity, there's the pathical aspect of reality as well. And it's different from the logical perspective. And when we say that emotionally, I would say this is my truth, or rationally, I would say it's my truth, you're already using both the logos and the pathos. Right. And it's only at times when you need to reconcile logos and pathos to try to come up with a unity of the two, because you just want to do that, you go into the mythical realm. This is why we tell about the world to children because they're not grown up enough yet to understand the world. We tell them what they can understand at certain ages. We tell it through mystical, mythical storytelling called fairy tales. And in a way, we just do more advanced fairy tales than we grown ups, except that they're much more, much more logical, much more pathical, much more oriented towards the world because we, as we grow and become more grown up, our storytelling becomes more adequate to the actual needs of the world because we're adults. Mm -hmm. So this this is my argument. I, well, we yeah, don't have to we, agree, we need but, stories to even have any idea of reality and totally meaning and to be able to move truths. in our lives. So I say so there are absolute stories, fairy tales truths. are are necessary. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I I think so. One of the Father Seraphim Rose to go back to him. Uh, mm -hmm. His probably his biggest and most important work, I, at least what I've read so far, is a book called Genesis, Creation, and an Early Man. Um, and there he has a very strong criticism of what. I would call something like the expansion of evolutionary theory to be a meta principle for understanding all of reality and being. And especially what it points to is a, uh, a kind of foundational understanding that everything is always progressing and heading towards, you know, eventually even just enlightenment by itself without us having to do anything whatsoever. It's, it's a natural understanding of like, you know, evolution just happening by itself and things are getting better and we're all getting more intelligent and, you know, and it's also heading towards transhumanism probably or something like that, that we're all- Yeah, but know, those are different- change to the next species. We, we can't, we can't so. blame that on Darwin because Darwin never wrote any such thing. Darwin was- No, this is more the modern interpretation and use yeah. of it. No, but that's uh, called progressivism and that's different. So progressivism is one thing, evolutionary yeah. theory is something different. Evolutionary theory in itself is very nihilistic to be honest about it. So even if it would be, you know, that's, perfectly that's true, whatever. Father from Rose's, uh, yeah. one of Evolution the theory on its own is not enough for you to look at the world that goes spiritual. It, you can just accept it. We Sorastas have no problem with evolution at all because at the end of the day, Sorastasism is focused on how do we build a functioning community? How do we build a congregation together that holds together? What does that take? That's what Sorastas completely focuses on. The it problem is, is in a materialistic society like we have today, then evolution does become actually our foundational story of what it means to be a human being. Uh, yes. And so, you know, and, and it's it's completely opposed to the Christian story. The Christian story, man was actually created in paradise uh, as uh, and very close to God, walking with God. And yeah. and it's and and the evolutionary story is man comes from a monkey. And before that, he was just basically slime. Uh, and so it's, it's actually the exact opposite trajectory. Right. And we just kind of like naturally progressing up towards the next thing, basically. Uh, to become enlightened beings. I would say, I would say, this is interesting though. The Abrahamic religions are doing a great job here because they're doing the fall. They're doing like, there is a state which worked. We fell from it, but we can come back to it. Mm -hmm. So Rastanism doesn't do this. So Rastanism basically says, we don't even know our history that well to know there was anything there. So let's try to create that anyway. So Rastanism doesn't have a fault. We don't have a concept of sin. And precisely because we do not have the concept of sin, so Rastans have to practice every day the meditation, the focus on being constructive about a role in our community. So we instead sit and are obsessed with constructive mentality to spend them on you because and that we doesn't don't make have sense to me. Concept. If you don't have a concept of sin, then everything is allowed. That was also no, 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 it's not at all. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not about being allowed. It means to miss the mark. If you can never miss the mark, it means you always hit the mark no matter what yeah. you do. No, no, I, I would disagree. How is, so, how is, how is that? So Rastanism seems to work really well. It's, you know, it's the wealthiest religion in the world per capita. It's the most educated religion world per capita. So, so I must say, at least the Sorastans have figured out a few things to keep the community together. Also, the divorce rate among Sorastans is but probably the most But how do you say the that world. they don't so have a concept of sin? Yeah. How do yeah. you have a 
how do you say that not having a concept of sin means you have to take life seriously at all? Like, why can't I just eat, drink, and be merry and pursue maximum because, pleasure, he because, hedonistic see, lifestyle? What we're saying is that if you sit there and play around with being that destructive person, you got to discover there's a traumatic reason why you became that destructive person in the first place. You got to get bored with your assault in the intensity. Listen, love, community, loving others, being loved. We're humans. We're humans. We want to be inside the tribe, the community, the Anjuman, the church. It's all about that for Zoroastrians. What you do is that you basically realize, what is my part of all of this? And I actually believe the people who do join the community and said, I'm devoted, I want to be a bedin, a Zoroastrian, what they mean is that they want to be a constructive part of that community. They want the, the others to tell them, what could I do possibly to expand this entire community to be a force for good in the community? That is deeply, deeply human. So if people are sitting there nihilistically being bored with it, I said, so racism is not for you. This is all about real strict practice every day to stay on the constructive side of things. And this is why it's misunderstood as a fight between good and evil to excite for the good. Fine. The fairy tale version we tell our kids probably would agree with that. But when you actually sit down as a grown up and a critically thinking person who's considering converting to Zoroastrian religion, then certainly you must understand that Spenta Manu, Ura Manu is the only thing you care about. This is the thing you do every day. The world is full of Asha, the world will do you. Do you side? Do you take the side? Why would you Asha not Druid? pursue you... pleasure, Alexander? I can, I can pursue pleasure, but the pleasure must be expansive. It must be expanding for me and other people around me. It cannot be the selfish, obsessive. What the if there's hidden, hidden pain and suffering for other people that you never meet? What? What if there's there's if there's even more pain and suffering caused for people that you never meet that or that aren't around you? Well, at the end of the day, you can only be responsible for your intentions. And your intentions should expand throughout your life because of more knowledge. This is why it's called Ahura and Master. Aura means being, a master means mind. So what you do in your life is that you try to make your mind more expansive and have a greater mind and learn things. This is a very pro-educational religion and it's also very pro having different sources of, of, of information and things to learn about things. Like the critical thinking is integral to the religion. So what you also ask them is to try to learn things and expand your mind. Now, if you just lazily sit on the side and don't expand your mind at all, then your intention is going to be pretty perverted after a while because your intention will not be in line with what you're expected to do at a certain age. So when you're 20, when you're 30, when you're 40 years of age throughout your life, you're supposed to have grown and be more responsible and have learned quite a few things about life. And finally, you reach a master at old age, which is wisdom, and you all your life experience, you just sit there, you're older. I'm not there yet, but I hope to be there one day, like my mother is now. And you sit there, you're older, and you say, yeah, 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 I've been through this, I've been there before. I know how I fooled myself at that age and did this, but when I did this, actually, I felt really good about myself, and it worked, and it was true, and it was there, right? So you're only responsible for your intentions, but you can also be responsible for actually starting your intention at the point where you haven't really learned anything. You've been ignorant, you've been lazy, whatever. And that's also your own responsibility. So Sarasism throws it all straight back at you, but it has forgiveness. And this is what's beautiful with Christianity. The forgiveness Why would you need part. forgiveness if there's no sin? No, because the forgiveness in Sarasism is simply, if you fail, stand up again, try again. But that's sin. Failing a for sin. you it is. You see, it practically doesn't make any difference. I mean, it maybe maybe there's a maybe it's, it's a difference. Just a, 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 like a it's language a thing because I mean, you know, like there, there's. I mean, in, so no, the no, it thing, is, you have it, like guilt no. associated yeah, but, with Paul, sin. It isn't because we do we don't we don't believe in the we don't believe in the story about the original paradise. That's absent from Zoroastrianism. That is a Jewish innovation. That so, Islam so and let, but let, let me take this yeah. angle. So I mean, man is created to walk with God. Uh, and when man chooses to depart from God, that's sin. So sin... I think I think I think we're even more Christian in social aspects because we're actually with the concept of the Holy Spirit here. The concept is that the divine becomes the community, but the community is at flow, and that's what the community is supposed to do. Yeah, yeah that's so folks want to do. <laughs> and you know, the Holy Spirit is the congregation in Christianity as well. That's the whole point. Like, no, that's not that's Christ. not a, that's not a Christian term at all. <laughs> okay, not, maybe different Christianities then in that case. It's, it's a, yeah, no, but the Holy Ghost, of course, um, the Holy Ghost, the congregation, okay. one of the same thing. Yeah, yeah, okay. Maybe it's more Catholic. It's true, to be honest about it. Yeah. Less Orthodox. Yeah. Could be. And, uh, Catholicism can be many different things. You found, even though they have one pope, they're supposed to be one thing, but it's actually like all over the place. Anyway. Um, Alexander, um, I think we've spoken a lot about religion. Let's go a little bit into men's work.
uh, and talk yes. about that. I think we, we don't have to continue for very much longer. But uh, I hope the guys listen to this conversation, both Paul Robson and Alexander Bard fans out there, all you guys out there, listen to the conversation. Go into this world. Go into the world of religion and spirituality and philosophy and enjoy it. But never forget about your body. Go out every day and exercise. I'm 63 years old. I dance, I walk, and I swim almost daily. Yeah. Enjoy your body, be in good shape of your body, but then pursue these things. And yeah. I think you and I, I agree I'd say that like even you can't do men's work without pursuing some kind of spirituality connected yeah. to it. I mean, what, what really attracted me, Alexander, to orthodoxy, then, if you're going to say that, is is that it's not just about the mind and ideas. It seems to me that you this is all about developing. And Zerashtim is a very big focus on the mind and your ideas. In the orthodoxy, mm -hmm. it's actually about living the faith. Yes. Uh, and so there's there's embodied is, practices. So it's the the master is the mind. Who the body? We pros uh, do prostrations. Yes. We're not just we about agree. thinking agree. bigger thoughts, but it's about no. embodied practice. Uh, and, yeah. and and I think that's why a lot of men are, are attracted to it as well is because it's, it, it, it gets over this. And this is something that the entire Western hemisphere is just totally obsessed with uh, ideas and, and they're not actually connected into their bodies. And so 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 I'd say, yeah, great. I mean, this is I really like John Ravakey conversations with him as well, because he just says this in much better than I can say it. He, he's like, you know, like if you don't adopt one of the old traditions of religion, you're just basically buying into the mainstream culture which is yeah. a sick and you know it's headed over into the abyss basically it's not going anywhere and so yeah. you need to you need to you need to investigate the traditions and and take them seriously and understand them John uh, and I are going to record podcast this spring he's a Buddhist I'm a Zoroastrian we're going to have a conversation with Christians too we pursue exactly what you and I are doing right here John yeah. is fantastic yeah absolutely yeah. well yeah well good yeah um get find find you can find some very different classes of Christians but um but yeah absolutely that sounds great um so yeah, embodied, but I, then I, I fully agree on you. It's like, yeah, it's like, yeah, keep yourself in shape. Men's work, obviously we're, we're focused on as well. Um, a lot of, a lot of guys seem to appreciate doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I've actually joined the Danish military, um, in the home guard and started on doing patrol work. And now I have actually on this week, Friday, I have a group, one of my core core groups is going to be coming out here and we're, they're going to go like doing map orientation at nighttime and uh, all kinds of really difficult challenging basically hard military training uh, and they love it they got the guys just love it they 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 really bond together as men um and and i think even the whole of europe is waking up to this now because we have conflicts that are coming closer and closer on our borders and so we're realizing the necessity for having men again in our society we we need yes. them exactly the kind of guys that were like oh you're toxic masculinity we don't need you you know that they, so all of a sudden they're becoming a little bit more popular again, even in the mainstream and in government circles and things like that. They're realizing like in Denmark, we can't even recruit soldiers anymore. I, several years ago, the Danish government decided we want to have one brigade that would be ready in 180 days for action, for going, being sent into combat. 180 days is quite a long time, right? But they, they wanted to, to create this brigade and they gave themselves, I can't remember how many billions of kroner they invested in getting it ready. And, and, and they gave themselves a year to do it or something like that. And, Four years later, they still haven't created the brigade because they just can't get the people. They can't get the men. Oh, men really? We, we have an, we have an awakening in Sweden. We have an awakening in Sweden. But maybe it's because Sweden went way further than Denmark into the other ditch, you know, with radical feminism and everything. We have a, a, an awakening here. It's fantastic to see. I'm right at the forefront of it. You know, Victor, for example, we're leading the men's movement here. And we also started a new Swedish chapter that where everybody speaks Swedish of the men's movement in Sweden. Because, you know, the guys that are between 17 and 23 years old today, they're totally on fire. They, they understand they've been totally fooled. Uh, and maybe it's just that Sweden went further than Denmark because I think we've had the turn here. I think, I think we definitely, there's a huge interest in joining the military. And, and we're also a lot closer to, to the conflicts in Sweden as well. We have a long border to protect. So there's definitely something happening here, big time in Sweden. Just joining NATO, you know, we were outside, the of, it. Can't, uh, can't outside of it. The Swedish to get out and say that he, that Sweden should prepare for war with Russia. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's he's so a great, he's a great guy. He's a friend of mine. He's he's, he's also potentially a member of the men's movement. He called Oscar Berlin. He's a great guy. But that's actually what happened here. So that's a good sign here. Maybe we went further than the Danes did before we could actually have that turn and, and, and realize. You guys that. also though you haven't been under the wing of the United States and NATO for all, for for as long as we have. Or, True, and uh, we have Finland we, very close to our the military. Yeah. That Finland Denmark and Sweden hasn't. were the same country for 600 years. The Finns are very close to us, and the Finns know that they have to prepare for whatever they do as well. I'm sure the Russians think the same way, but at the end of the day, they, there are these different conflictual zones in Europe right now, and we have just woken up to them, and, and territories have changed and moved. 
over the last 30 years. And of course, that would lead to conflict. So I, I think I think it's an awakening. But I'm more interested in the spiritual side of things, though. And, and you and I started some 10 years ago, and, and we did work together for several years. And they went different different ways. And basically, our movement has also expanded. So that was only a natural thing. We're doing the European Men's Leadership Summit. We try to do it every year and connect through that so the different men who do men's work in many different countries can get to meet and learn from each other and have best practice. As soon as somebody's done something that works, all the other guys are free to copy it and see if they can do it in their own country. So I think that's great. But but yes, we started some 10 years ago and I, and I at least came into the work with you with this sense that we now live in a society where men and women are forced to be together all the time constantly. That means men and women are living under constant sexual stress. You know, and we need desexualized spaces. And we found women who thought the same way and who started a new men's movement, at least women's movement here in Sweden, where women meet and not a man is around for days and only women in the room and they can, you know, let their hair out, take the makeup off, throw off the shoes and be relaxed with their sisters. We we create the same things here in Sweden, at least. This is a society where men and women are literally ideologically forced to be together constantly all the time in a way that really puts them under tons of stress. And I think the breakdowns people experience in the 30s and, and of course, loss of values, loss of valuations, all this puts pressure on people. And, and also they believe too much in their feelings. They go into romantic love mode. They jump from one job to the next. They can't even have a career path any longer. This lack of direction is also part of this. But by taking men out into a room with only men in the room and creating the sexualized space, that alone makes a difference. Mm -hmm. So I start men's work from there. Yeah. So, I mean, I, and I think you and me, we, we have a lot of similarities. And then we also have some differences in the way that we've worked. In, in Manifesto Core, we've actually very much moved away from both the uh, kind of ideological, political stuff and not having those conversations anymore. We don't, you know, guys can come and tell their stories about why they're angry with women one time, but we don't want to hear it multiple times. If they want to come exactly. and then we tell them like, you know, get your act together. We're not interested yes. in, in all your sub stories. But we, I've also moved Manifesto Core very much away from the um, spiritual and religious realm uh, as well. Uh, so basically what we do is we have a very, very simple process where a guy comes in, he learns how to formulate a vision of where he wants to move towards in his life. Uh, he then sets concrete goals that will move him towards that vision. And then he sets up daily habits that he starts working on that can start creating you know, building him to be the kind of man who can reach those goals and 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 get where he wants to be. And, and so the guys have daily contact actually in our groups. Uh, they meet every single week uh, with the rest of the group in an online meeting. And then they meet up at least once a year in person and do some tough stuff together so they get to see each other under pressure uh, when things are, you know, when they're tired, they're hungry, they're frustrated and they want to give up and they need each other to support to get through a certain task. Um, this is great men's work, by the way. And you and not... I... We were we were very supportive of the men's movement that already existed. We started ten years ago, but we just we just knew we needed to start sharp, fresh, to to try to rediscover what was there. It was all about guys sitting around talking about their feelings when we started. A lot right? of it was, yeah. Kind and of I, like for example, the man kind of product has been around. It's been totally revitalized in the last five years. The guys who do MKP now say it's been totally revitalized. So the different parts of the men's movement have started having an influence on each other. And it's very quality oriented. I can tell manifest the core is the same way. I, I love the quality of the whole thing. It, it's it's this is this is this is boiling it down to its essentials and then pursuing the essentials fully. And I think that's perfect. Great work. I mean, there's there's a basic work. You know, someone commented on one of my YouTube videos the other day and they said, oh, there's like, this is like a pantomime with, you know, just going through these procedural knowledges. And if you just do this kind of these steps, then things will be fine and everything will work out. And, you know, what's lacking is actually guys knowing, having a deeper sense of, of knowing who they are and where they want to go to. And that's something that does come through, you know, transcended experience or something like that so I, I completely agree with that guy but a lot of guys have just had like tastes of those kinds of experiences and they need to be integrating them into their lives and so manifesto core is one of the communities where guys can do that um together with other men and obviously my person plays a certain role i'm an orthodox christian so if people have a really big issue with christianity they're not going to come um but we still have far more non-christians than we than we have christians in, in our in our networks actually in our groups uh, i've come i've tried experimenting with one group just with Orthodox Christians or catechumens. Um, I don't think I'm going to do much more of them, actually. It's a great group. It means that there's a really strong shared foundation. Oh, spread um, them out. The Christian yeah. guys in the Swedish men's movement are a fantastic asset, but they are a minority. Yeah. But they're great. They're great. Great contributors. Yeah, yeah. yeah I very think we're going to remain a minority Very often, well. very solid as well. They're often family men and things like that are very solid, and we really appreciate that. They're great. I think spread them out. It's a good idea. Yes. I think, I think a men's group should represent men in society today. 
And when you start a men's group for yourself to put yourself on a spiritual path, then your local men's group is not going to be your best friends. Because they won't tell you the honest truth. No, it's going to be a series of men, different generations, happen maybe to live in the same vicinity as you do, but you're only going to see them for a limited time. Say two years is a good period because then you really go to the things. But a good men's group runs for about maximum two years. It's set out from the very beginning what it's going to do. It has a theme that you follow through. It has a group of men of different generations, different ages. So you get both the wisdom of the elders and you get the energy of the young guys in the same group. That's that. Those are the best men's groups. Every one of them report back to both you and me. This is what a good men's group is. And different convictions, different life choices, yes. But the guys who do choose a spiritual path are more committed to their own work. Uh, I, I don't believe in the pure self-help thing that came out of America, like read this book and you're going to be successful because it only trades the men to be rivals with other men. And Cain and Abel is the first story you must read before you do men's work. No, it's not about rivalry. It's about getting over, transcending the rivalry. That there's a healthy thing about comparison. You go into the wrestling ring and wrestle it out with another guy. You honor him if he's stronger than you are. He will honor you if you're stronger than him. That's great because it creates a sound hierarchy between men. But the rivalry thing, you need to get that out of your head because this is about finding brothers who you collaborate with and create a great, great team with. And this is what men dream about, having that team. Yeah. And I think that's central to men's work. Yeah. The thing that I've really found that's come through again and again as well is, is the ability to be stable. Uh, and this is why I think I've also had this experience that just the Christian guys, they, if you're a Christian in Scandinavia today, especially if you're, you know, you're actually a practicing Christian, it means that you've taken a fairly unpopular choice where you risk being ridiculed and kind of excluded a little bit from popular uh, intelligence, intelligentsia in the big cities and stuff like that. Um, but you're actually also, you're connected to a tradition, which is, you know, anchored in a place where you're living. Uh, and it's also something you can really dive into. Whereas I find a lot of people are into, and I'd actually like to hear your opinion on this, um, is that so many guys who go into Eastern religions, they treat it as like a kind of candy shop where they can pick and choose and there's no groundedness. There's no single teacher. And so they're just all over the place. Uh, and, and it's a very, effem it's a very worst... effeminate way of approaching spirituality. I totally agree with you. No, yeah. I don't do that at all. If you ask John for Barkey as a Buddhist or me as a Zoroastrian, well, we tell the guys, if you're going to go into spirituality, it's going to take an awful lot of time. You better be committed to it. For example, if you have a calling to be monk, you could afford to do it probably because you're going to spend a lot of your time doing spiritual studies. Fine, then do it. But if the guys come to me and say, I want to pick a spiritual path, then you might as well try Christianity first because where you're born and where you are grounded already, your community, the church is around the corner. It probably needs a guy like you to walk through the door and try to live in it and see what happens. Pursue it. I mean, this one I'm telling the guys, Christianity is a great first option to study. But if you want to go deep into spirituality, you will discover alternatives. And at the end of the day, you must commit to the spiritual school you believe in. Pick the one that's closest to you. Where you, can play, the the role, uh, right? where you, you can play the largest possible role. Where you can play the largest largest possible role, right? And of course, I traveled around the world in the 1980s and the 1990s. I came to India. I was I was to become a philosopher. I knew that my generation would break up with the idea that it all started with the Greeks and here are the Greeks and here's Plato, blah blah. I knew I would break with that tradition and go deeper than that. I discovered Persia by discovering India and China first. I was very close to converting to Taoism, like Alan Watts but decided in 1992 that the little switch I made over to Persian culture, which was also closer to European culture and closer to the West, was my choice. And I was offered, this was early in the 1990s, before Zoroastrianism became an option for thousands, and I picked it. I still think Buddhism is the first Eastern spirituality that comes to the West that's now taking itself seriously. I often go to Buddhist monasteries to meditate, and these are the good ones that have done the work properly in the real Buddhist monasteries. Not any pop versions. I don't do pop at all. I don't pick and choose from different traditions. I agree with you completely. You might do that at the beginning, just have a little taste of it, but choose your own path and take it seriously. And the thing is, once you pick a tradition and take it, at least if you're a monk, and maybe one out of 20 guys should be a monk like me, but if you're a monk and you want to take your spiritual path seriously, you will study all religions and you will study all of spirituality. You study all of theology before you're finished and you will enjoy it. You will dig into it and you will then come up with certain proposals to your brothers when they ask you for questions and they have asked us and they want to answer to it because your focus is on being that monk who probably becomes an uncle for great nieces that your brothers are having and things like that. And that's your role in the community. 
radically, completely opposed uh, definition of what a monk is compared to the Christian tradition, I should mention. True. Uh, yeah, I am a tantric uh, monk, as you know. Uh, Buddhist. Basically nothing in common. Um, true, but, true, true. And, and, but and, I've, and I've your stayed, lifestyle as well. I've stayed even in a monastery in the White Sea in northern Russia in the middle of winter. So yeah, at least I did the work. I, I did the work. As, well. as you did uh, before you raised your family. Though, yes. But it doesn't yes. seem like... Uh, <laughs> Um, but anyway, um, what one thing I'd like to cover just before, and I actually sent an, a question out on the, we still have the manifesto email list. I actually, before this conversation, wrote out to the guys and I said, hey guys, I'm going to talk to Alexander again uh, after a long time. What do you think I should ask him about? And the first question that someone wrote to me was something along the lines of like, um, kings and priests in the men's movement using these different archetypes and stuff like that. I think he was trying to refer a little bit to you and me. And to tell you the truth, actually, when I read his question, I felt concerned because what I felt was that what I see this tendency is for people to put me up on a pedestal. Um, mm. Probably I do it myself sometimes. I'm probably a bit arrogant and prideful and 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 so invite this kind of thing. I enjoy power and and that kind of stuff. But 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 I also think it's a very unhealthy tendency for people to look to us as gurus almost or something like that as leaders. So and and this is what I think is is the problem in the men's movements is that everybody's kind of looking for somebody to follow who they don't always know very well. And it's like, it's like, I'm not a, I, I'm a, just another guy. And I, I, I struggle to, you know, like get, I'm not perfect at all. Like I, I have a lot of opinions, but so I'm, I'm just curious about your idea there. I know that a lot of people have put you in the guru seats as well and made you in a guru. And, and so how do you see your own role? Well, I, I start by taking down the word guru because I actually work in India every year. So guru just means teacher, period. It means nothing else. So if you apply guru to me, at well, best, I'm a teacher. it's a spiritual teacher. teacher that you submit yourself to. No, 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 no. Yeah. no not really. The guru, the guru no, tradition, no, you submit yourself to your guru. Ex the same in the orthodox space. We no, submit ourselves to a spiritual no, father. No, no. A guru has 10,000 followers. It's, it's absolutely a false guru. No, the, the that's thing a is pop, that, That's a pop Western guru. Exactly, that's exactly, something. exactly. No, that's not what the word means. Guru basically is a professor. So, for example, if I teach at an Indian university, usually an anthropology department or something like that, which because I'm good at anthropology, then what they do is that in the evenings when it gets cooler, we go out on a lawn and they got 40 students sitting in a circle. And first, I give them a lecture, say 45 minutes, an hour or so. And after that, we have questions and answers and the sharpest students come up with great questions. And I basically tell them why the questions are good to begin with so I can make them think for themselves. And then the session is over within three hours and it's nine o'clock in the evening, go eat something. That's what a guru does in India. It's a professor. I, I disagree. That's what I think that, okay, that's, but a that's what the word Western, originally means. That's, that's a modern Western version of a guru. No, uh, no, this is what a guru is in India because I work in India and I'm called a guru. But I'm absolutely. nothing more than that. I'm nothing more than a teacher. So if you if if you predict anything on me, you're wrong. And here's the thing. I teach the things I am good at because I've studied them carefully and thought about them properly. I do not teach things I'm terrible at. I'm the first person that says I outsource anything I possibly can, which I'm terrible at. And I'm terrible at lots of things. I'm terrible at cleaning to begin with. So don't least... ask Alexander Bard about marrying a woman because he'll give you bad advice. Exactly, because I... <laughs> I have I have a girlfriend for 24 years, but like me, she escaped the, the whole marriage saying we don't have children. So I'm disqualified you see your girlfriend, from Alexander? being a good counselor. Being, I tell men to go and see men who are married and are successfully married and ask mm -hmm. advice about that. All I can say is that from the point of view that I'm not married, I can give you this advice, that I love married men. I admire them deeply. This is what I see in them. But to actually learn what it's like to be a married man, you have to ask a married man, right? So yes, I am the first to point out I'm not very good at that. I have a very amateurish opinion about it, which is actually not that much at all. Go and ask somebody who knows. This is why you can correct about Orthodox Christianity because you actually practice it, you study it, etc. And I appreciate when you correct on it because if I'm wrong about something about Orthodox Christianity, I want to know because I want to learn about it. But I'm an expert on Zoroastrianism. I'm probably one of the world's greatest scholars of Zoroastrianism after having pursued it for the last 40 years and studied it carefully, learned the Western language and done the work. So I will not... I will know and I will defend my authority when I have knowledge about something and I will gladly value my arguments against somebody else in deba debate who's on a par with that and has done the work. Yeah. No problem. I should, I should just mention- then, I'm, I'm, I'm a teacher in that sense, but I do mm -hmm. not want to be a pedestal and I want the guys to be you know, their own rulers, their own kings or whatever. It's just that in leadership, in terms of leadership in the community, the first of, of archetype, before we men even think about man or woman, because that's the reward system, that comes later. The first thing we must understand is that among the leaders, who is the smartest guy in the group? 
you should hold the guys wise. And who is the strongest guy in the group? Because if we're going to fight and go to war or we're going to go hunting, who's the strongest guy means a lot. These are the primary archetype that we call priest and chief in our work, which is anthropological work. And that's about leadership as a principle. It's not about finding that guy and putting him on the pedestal, whatever. It's more like in the community, like if you are six guys doing a project together, who takes the priestly, most priestly, who takes the most chiefly role is a good idea to actually find out early because somebody's got to take the leadership role in the group. So these are just principles for organization we're talking about. And after priest and chief, we must understand the difference between warrior and hunter. Because hunters work every day and they kill animals and warriors actually kill other human beings, which is a very, very different thing. Once we sorted those two dichotomies out, we can start looking at the most beautiful one, which is man and woman. Mm -hmm. That's what I teach. So there you go. Yeah, quite a, quite a, few, a couple of things that I just want to mention. So one thing is you probably are the one of the people in the West who know the most about Zoroastrianism. I, I'm just starting my journey into orthodoxy. So I consider myself not a teacher of orthodoxy. I'm, I'm a lay person. I am studying with the best orthodox seminary uh, that I was able to find. It was not easy to find an English language seminary that really went into the church fathers. A lot of them were introduced or influenced by all kinds of other stuff of Protestantism, which we had to study together with them. So we had like black theology, post-colonial theology, feminist theology in our courses as well. I was like, no, I don't want any of that. I just want like the church fathers, please. And I don't want the fashions. I want the foundation. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And they were like, so oh, you can yeah. just go and argue with them and tell them why you think they're wrong. I'm like, I'm going to pay you money so I can go and argue with post-colonial feminist black theology. I can do that on Facebook if I want to argue with people about that. Are you crazy? Um, so anyway, um, so that I didn't appreciate that at all. Uh, but luckily there are places. I'm studying with Holy Trinity Seminary in Jordanville. It's an amazing place. Father Sarah from Rose himself studied there. There's been several saints who have been who have been uh, uh, professors there. Um, very, very uh, great place uh, to, to study. I'm looking forward to hopefully getting to visit them sometime. Um, but uh, the other thing that you mentioned is the, the priest was the smartest guy in the tribe. Um, mm. and, and I think that's just another thing that where we would differ again is that for us, the, the priest is, the priest's job is actually to represent God to people. Uh, and so normally what, what the Orthodox church has ended up doing, you know, we have very high standards for priests, but obviously priests fail at those standards. Sometimes some of them deceive mm -hmm. people and, and misuse their, their job. And so, uh, the way that we see it is that the, the, the priest plays a role, um, and and he 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 represents Christ through the liturgy, and that's why our services are highly structured. They're extremely formal at the same time as being incredibly informal in some weird way. You kind of have to experience it to see what it is. Um, but but the priest just has to play that this role. Is of... a, there's a difference here between the role of the priest in a contemporary community, which is describing it, which is a mobed in Zoroastrianism, and uh, the priest as an archetype. Mm -hmm. So I'm talking about a nomadic tribe on the move 30,000 years ago or something like that when I used the priest. And I don't want to use the word shaman because the word shaman is tempted as a wild guy out in the forest. It's not a leader. So it's this is why we use the word thing, priest. Yeah. So priest opposite the chief is just the first two archetypes among men, like what we aspire to. And we are both these inside of us because one brain is the more priestly brain the logical brain and one part of the brain is more is more oh, is more of the chiefly side which is the more emotional brain the masculine emotional brain so we do have the logos and the pathos fundamentally that is in the male brain the two brain halves of a male brain are representatives of priest and chief so but these, Alex, these this are like this is an example of gainers like for me theology isn't about the mind and log logos and logic uh -huh. it, the, the theology is is the living experience of god in life in every yeah, aspect but of I life. love theology, but this, is, archi this to... is archetypology. So archetypology is a good basis to understand other men in the community before you go into the theological aspect of reality. Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm a huge fan of theology. All right, theology is deep philosophy. You, you can't do philosophy is... unless you do theology too. But but the priest, there's the priestly role, like there's a priest who puts on a robe and performs a certain sort of role. Mm -hmm. And that starts, you know, with Mesopotamia probably like 8,000 years ago because it served the purpose of actually walking up the stairs all, I think it's towards the Sigurat, the time. to declare peace between the different valleys or whatever. Yeah. So we, we have we have that with the religion, but there's, so, there's so a our, deeper priestly priest the archetype. The priest yeah. is, he, he mediates between the divine and, and the human. He, he He's the one who, he has to be invisible in that process and, and he has to be a channel for that to be 
to be if to if through. my god is wisdom itself then that's certainly what i would tell people and ascribe to the priest and also hold them responsible for taking that role so this is what we have in common actually in zoroastrianism that Ramakrishna. we do ascribe the priest to be closest to god to talk to god on our behalf etc yeah you but your god for me is very uh ethereal and idea based whereas my god is actually incarnate yes it's true it's a difference in christianity and zoroastrianism yeah we just have philosophers. We don't. We don't have any. We have philosophers. We have priests. And we have chiefs in the community. We have women. We have men. But we do not have that incarnate God. That that is a very Christian concept. Mm -hmm. Beautiful yeah. concept too. But it's not so Russian. It's true. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. It's it's quite revolutionary and quite crazy if you step it, into it. The idea <laughs> comes from Zoroastrians because the idea originally is the Zoroastrians. The Zoroastrians was first explored by Zoroastrians as a savior who comes at a time of great distress and complete decadence where the culture is about to fall apart. Christ was and, prophesied, and, but the social story. Christ the, the was social, like Moses prophesied. The social is, is a function. Mm -hmm. it, it's not necessarily personified in Zoroastrianism. It becomes personified as the Moshaya in Judaism. It's inherited and lived, and according to Christians and some Jews who became Christians, it is Christ. So Christ is the Messiah who comes to save humanity, or rather, show God's love and mercy towards humanity on the cross. And this is the Christian idea. So what we say in, in Zoroastrianism is that. Christ is, is a social to Christians, and we can respect him because social to Christians, we can respect him as a spiritual teacher. But we do not believe that God is ever reincarnated in the sense that we are all mind and we all have mind and we're all creating a large mind together. It's much more esoteric in Zoroastrianism than in Christianity. It's not a personified incarnate God. But the idea of the Savior is as old as Zoroastrianism. It starts Zoroastrianism because the, that it's fine. It's fine. I'd say in every tradition, social. actually. I mean, yeah, Socialist so, is the word for us. Yes. Like this is something that Protestants often get like all kind of defensive about, but in in, Christ, in in Orthodox Christianity, like all traditions for us point to Christ. Like like you know, the, there's a book actually called Christ in the Eternal Tao, which is like how Taoism is also pointing to You have three Sorastians who come to Bethlehem in the New Testament. I mean, there's no. there is a connection, right? Because Persia was seen as the center of wisdom in the world, and three Persian prophets come to you know they, we don't even know the three. Persian prophets and angels saying in the sky come and the child is born in Bethlehem. It's to ascribe, it's of course to ascribe a status to Christ in Christianity that this is the social. Mm -hmm. And he is not the coming, he's coming here. It's this guy, he's the guy. So yeah, it, it's, there are these connections, they're interesting. We do not, but so practicing Sorastas today do not believe in an incarnate God. We believe that we ourselves have to go and try to become as divine as we possibly can. And the divinity itself is not us as people, it is the community that we create together. Right. Let's say put the divinity of Zoroastrianism. The Anjuman is, is the most sacred thing in Zoroastrianism. It's all about the Anjuman. It's all about the community. So um, uh, I think we've covered a lot of ground here. That's that's. I great. love this conversation, um, Paul. <laughs> yeah, it's been, it's been enjoyable. Um, I do have yeah. a guy I'd like you to talk to. We've we've spoken about it before, and I think you you said uh, you'd like to have a chat with him. His yeah. name's Jay uh, Dyer. Uh, he's yeah. he's more of a philosopher, so you'll be two philosophers talking to each other. Yeah. Um, both of you are good at having strong, opinionated conversations. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure that that will be interesting to see. He's certainly a guy I could learn a lot from. I'd love to have a conversation with him. So yeah. let's look at yeah, that. And, and he can definitely talk about the faith in a far more deep and well-founded way than I can as well. Because as I said, I'm still I'm still just getting into it myself. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, and he's been there a lot longer. So um, yeah, let's see if we can if we can make that happen. Uh, a lot of people, really good about that. I, a lot of people on our shared network know of Jay Dyer. And have said, oh, I'd love to hear Alexander and Jay talking. So yeah. uh, I think I think that'll be great. And I don't know if you can make it, Paul, but we're going to be about 20 leaders from different parts of the men's movement to Europe, a variety of the meeting in Berlin in June this year. Uh, yeah. They can get in contact with you and me and you can pass the contact to, to see. But they, if, if you apply to be one of those guys, then certainly you need to put a CV in there and what your actual leadership role is, because it will be the 20 guys that are applying to come to that event that are the most leaders, whatever, that do the most leadership work in the mass moment, so we can learn from each other as much as possible. The point yeah. is not to I mean, I, we can go into why I'm not coming yeah. there, Alexander, if you want to, uh, but I'm yes. not coming. You uh, and, okay. and personally, actually, I really appreciate all the good intentions going in there, but I actually mm -hmm. um, have decided not, not to join that. Um, sure. That's your choice, uh, so, perfectly. Yes, yeah, but yeah. we are both part of the network. Both Paul and I are part of the European Man Men's Leadership Summit. The network around it. We are yeah. in contact. We, we with started. Each other. We started it. It's something that we started together. And I've yeah. I've found that it's just not worth a trip to Berlin for me uh, mm -hmm. this year. Um, I really appreciate so much things about John, um, and I I just feel like 
I, it's it's I I can't see the value of going down there for 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 myself to take time away from my family. Uh, it's it's much harder for me. It, you know, I I I really have a lot of priorities on on, on my family time. Paul, stay local. Do your fantastic work. Stay online and manifest the core. Do the work you do. You do a terrific job. That's just great. And we have a lot of leaders out of Europe are not coming to Berlin in June. It's just that I wanted to say that the opportunity exists there. So there is that network. I get what I get from that experience is that I'm also very involved in several products in Germany. So it's a good chance for me to meet guys from outside of Sweden who are working in the market. So that's also by, by Berlin. So I'm going to Berlin in June, in June. But this is what we all have to consider for ourselves as leaders of the men's moment, if, what events we tend to and what we prioritize. Absolutely. Yeah, good. Thanks, Alexander cool. Bard. Much appreciated. Thank um, you, Paul Robson. And cheers to you. Yes, soon. Cheers to you. And, and uh, cheers to South Africa and Scandinavia, these utter poles of the planet. Yeah. Cheers, though. And cheers to our brothers.